everybody. Welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is The Daily Show, where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning is your Collider Movie Talk crew. First up, senior producer John Campia. Well, hot damn, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. And we are so thrilled and honored and pleased that you took a little bit of time away from Fallout 4 to join us here today. <laughs> Day. Uh, Dennis, also here, it's writer director John Schneck. That's right. I'm not playing Fallout 4 so that I can be here to talk about movies with you guys, but I want to be playing Fallout 4 right now. <laughs> and also, Mark Ellis. I've never played a Fallout game in my life, but I can save a princess as an Italian plumber. <laughs> now, I should let you know that if at some point during the live show today, if it looks if the camera doesn't switch, you see no camera switching happen for like fifteen or twenty minutes at a time. It's because Dennis has snuck out the back door to continue playing Fallout Four. Thank you, Dennis, for taking time Thank today you, Dennis. to come Dennis, in and doing you. the show today. Thank you. Oh yeah, sorry, he's got it open on the other computer side. Set up. So we'll try to keep him up uh, up to date. What's going? On. Hey, listen, as happens sometimes, a little thing dropped before we started. After we already wrote the show notes today, the new trailer. I dare I say the first trailer for the upcoming My Big Fat Greek Wedding 2 has dropped. Talk about uh, you know long distances in between uh, sequels. Um, <laughs> it dropped, look, I'm gonna, I'll start this thing off, I can tell you right now. I loved the original My Big Fat Greek Wedding. I must have watched that film like 20 times. Partially because it reminds me a lot of my Italian family, which I'm sure a lot of European descended families could relate what's going on. But for me and my Italian family, it's like, holy crap, that is totally my family, even though it was Greek. Um, but I just thought it was charming and cute. And how that, it was a really interesting Hollywood story too, because this Nina, I can't say her right name. Verdolis. Yeah. Verdolis. She tried and tried to try to get that that movie made. Then she got um, Tom Hanks's wife, uh, Rita Wilson. Thank you very much, Rita Wilson Gosh, on board. Snap goes up one on Ellis. And then Rita and Tom, they just finally said, "Screw it, we're going to make it ourselves. We're going to finance ourselves." Turns into this huge, massive hit. And I've been a little bit nervous because they remember they tried the TV show, My Big Fat Greek yes, Wedding, they did and the it TV was show. awful. Jeez. It was so bad. The trailer came out today. I gotta tell you, I, I adored it. I was smiling from beginning to end. I love that they had all of the original cast mm -hmm. back. The dad is still super funny. I still laughed at everything the dad was doing. Um, like, I, like, I don't know. This movie, Big Fat Greek Wedding 2, could go the way of my Big Fat Greek Wedding. It could go the way of the TV series, my Big Fat Greek Wedding. I, I don't know. All I'm gonna say is that I watched a trailer and I smiled and my heart felt warm and I just, I enjoyed it. So anyway, Mark, you had a chance to f watch it this morning. What do you think Yeah, I mean, it? look, we can say about this trailer is that the movie it's advertising has a very tough act to follow because the first one was, I believe, the highest grossing independent film of all time when it came out. And so now how do you follow that? Well, you have another marriage and this time you have some sort of mix up with the grandparents now because the couple that was getting married in the first one now has a kid of their own that's going away. So you have a lot of leaving going on. You have Possibly coming together and I like this trailer I like the second half in particular because mm -hmm. the first cup I was like okay what are we really doing here why is this called my big fat Greek wedding too for not having a wedding oh wait we are having a wedding and then I started laughing particularly like you said at the older folks yeah. I like the senior citizen vibe they were hysterical there were a couple really good jokes in there towards the end I love the two women trying to take a picture right, and then hold each other's <laughs> necks the neck thing that was a neck great right. the neck grab that was so funny it was a great joke so watching all the antics leading up to the wedding I just hope we don't get too bogged down in in the the mother daughter relationship because that's not the appeal of my big fat Greek wedding too to me anyway I'm sure there's going to be some fine moments in there but I want it to be funny not just dramatic. Shep, what about you? Yeah, for me I was hesitant to even want to watch the trailer when uh, you guys were like, yeah, the new my big fat Greek wedding too. I was like, what? Oh, they're just soaking for that money, right, son? Because a TV show sucked. <laughs> and then I and I watched the trailer with some ambivalence and it won me over. I was like, all right, I get it. I mean, yeah, it is a return to the same well that made them successful. Like, how many years ago is it now? Twenty years? Oh, it's, I can't it's a lot it's of a years long ago. Time ago, man. Oh, we'll be doing it on a you know a segment very soon. The ten years or twenty years later, feeling old, but. <laughs> But they got everybody back, and it actually felt kind of real. And they were using and they're all still footage. Alive. They're still all alive, which is amazing. And it's like and good. And it's like they had clips from the old film. And that's when the very, the beginning of the trailer I was like, "What are they doing? Soaking in this old footage, marinating in their <laughs> previous success?" But then you get a chance to be like, "All right, cool." It it actually felt real. It felt like a natural progression 
to if you were going to revisit all these characters and have a little fun kind of, hey, remember these guys? They're back. So it was like a, a trip through, well, you know, memory lane, but like it felt refreshed enough where it wasn't just a money grab. And believe me, I know it's a money grab. I get it. But it's a good money grab because it feels it feels real. It, it almost it, I don't think it is a money grab simply because it's been so long since the first one that if they were going to cash in and try to do some other cheap wedding, they would have done it. This one, I'm sure it could be a money grab. Maybe they thought, hey, we could all use no, some cheddar. It, so yeah, let's they're make all this broke. They're again, like, hey, but... what, remember that hit from 20 years ago? Let's get that money. Son. Yeah, I mean, I don't know <laughs> how like... John Corbett or Nia Vardalos' <laughs> professional career is going right now. Right. I, I, I'm not I'm not in that world. I don't know what their personal lives are like. But this movie, I think it does feel like you said real. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Let's get to the first official topic today. We're now about seven months away from the opening of the newest X-Men film, X-Men Apocalypse, when it hits screens on May 27, 2016. But now we do know when the first trailer will arrive. In an interview with our own <laughs> Collider.com, writer-producer Simon Kimberg said the following. I can, in fact, confirm that information. Our first trailer will be on Star Wars The Force Awakens. It's our first thing out there, so it's somewhat of a teaser, but it's certainly longer than a minute, and it has a ton of cool stuff in it. John, is Star Wars a good place to drop the first X-Men Apocalypse trailer? Well, apparently, since Apocalypse is Snoke, apparently it's, <laughs> it fits perfect. That's a great graphic there yeah. for that. Th no, this is great, because now you're getting into that time frame. Once we get into December, you're getting into that time frame when the first trailer for this movie should be dropping right. for, for, for an event film like this. I like it. But man, Force Awakens is shaping up to be the greatest trailer fest <laughs> ever because it's already confirmed that they're putting the trailer for Captain America Civil War is going to be playing with it. Uh, now we know X-Men Apocalypse is going to be playing with it. There is rumor that there is talk that um, uh, Batman v Superman. Batman, there's be? talk that Batman v Superman may be, play, be, be playing in front of it, and there's talk that Deadpool may be playing in front of it. Like this is going to be the greatest yes. set right. of trailers in the history oh. of a movie theater. That's crazy <laughs> good. Um, but remember, like here's though, it's the story here is really not that. X-Men Apocalypse trailer is going to be playing with Star Wars. The real story is we now have the time when it's dropping because obviously this trailer, like every other, it's going to drop online probably a good 24 hours before it plays in front of the movie. But I'm starting to get real excited just for that trailer set for that movie. And I love that we're going to see it. Um, we're hearing a lot of tidbits coming out about the movie as well at this point from that great interview that Collider.com did with Simon Kimberg, and we'll get to those in a minute. But I, I think this is really great. The timing is right. Connecting it to an event like the release of Star Wars is a great idea. So uh, for me, I think it's a good idea all the way around. Schnapp, what about you? I just want them to schedule like <clears throat> two garbage trailers after all these amazing <laughs> ones so I can like take a moment to like nap and, and get my energy back. Because like seeing all these incredible visuals and trailers for all these big, big movies... But then I want to just be like, all right, need, I must chill for a moment and let the force come back to me, you know, <laughs> and disperse, have some bad trailers or something. Just like, let's all go to the movies. Just have like a five minute break. It's a please. lot of pressure on that singing hot dog. To keep I know. People in the please seats. bring the hot dog back and some popcorn or whatever. Just give me a break. But I cannot wait. This is exciting news. I mean, I know we're all jazzed to see the new Star Wars film, but to know that <clears throat> the Civil War trailer is opening and as well as the X-Men trailer, that's just that's almost too much. That that's audience. Pretty cool. This is like having I went to a great Concert, a U2 concert where the opening act was Lenny Kravitz. Right. This audience, by the time Star Wars Force Awakens starts, that audience is already going to be so revved up from these trailers. I'm stupid. Anyway, Mark, your thoughts on all this? I love trailers. It's Trailer Palooza 2015, yeah. <laughs> kids. Get your tickets now. And this is why I went on that mini rant yesterday about why people need to shut up during the previews because we want to watch this stuff on yes. the big screen. It's great to watch it online, okay? And I'm happy to watch my Big Fat Greek Wedding 2 trailer on my computer. But man, when I see Civil War trailer or I see Deadpool footage, I want to see it on the big screen, particularly with X-Men Apocalypse because I had the good fortune of being in Hall H when they showed that footage that wasn't as well received mm -hmm. as people were hoping for, particularly the way the dude whose name is in the movie, Apocalypse, looks. I'm interested to see if they've changed any of that stuff. They added any CGI to the trailer that everybody is going to be seeing now. That's a very curious thing. So there's so much to look forward to with Star Wars, the least of which is the other movies that are going to be advertised during the film. Do you guys want to bet that Deadpool is going to make some sort of Star Wars joke if there is oh, a trailer oh, attached oh, to so Star good. Wars? Absolutely. I, He's I probably holding a lightsaber, like a like a Kylo Ren lightsaber, something like that. He's gonna do <laughs> no, something. Since funny. it's R, he he could be having sex with some girl, and and then in a Darth Vader voice say, "I am your daddy." <laughs> like he, oh. I mean, that could happen. I mean, that's a that's a very good bet. I, I and I, I could think slide that in. Mm -hmm. I, know, I absolutely think that he's gonna do something like that. All right, what's next?
A brand new trailer for the upcoming crime film Triple Nine has just hit the web. The film boasts a large ensemble cast that includes Kate Winslet, Chiwetel Ejiofor, Anthony Mackie, Casey Affleck, Woody Harrelson, Gal Gadot, Aaron Paul, Norman Reedus, Clifton Collins Jr., and Teresa Palmer. A gang of criminals and corrupt cops plan the murder of a police officer in order to pull off their biggest heist yet across town. Triple Nine hits theaters on February 19th. Mark, your thoughts on the new Triple Nine trailer? My thoughts on the new Triple Nine trailer are where the hell is Kate Winslet? Oh my God, that's Kate Winslet? Yeah, Holy yeah, crap. Right? The, the first the first trailer that came out, I was like, oh, Kate Winslet's in this movie? Who is she? And right. still, I knew she was in the movie watching this trailer and I had no idea that was her until I saw the name Kate Winslet. This movie looks like a big surprise for 2016, man. Mm. I love the way they're marketing this movie. The international trailer might be even better than the one that we were all raving about a couple months right. ago on this very show. Like the, the way that you have the town feel, but it's it, with corrupt cops added to that mix. This thing looks like it could be a huge movie in the early part of the year and not because Casey is there but if you didn't know better like I watch this trial I would just assume this was a Ben Affleck picture I would assume that this was a Ben Affleck right. directed film it feels like one of his films but it is not even though Casey is in there this could I, I totally agree this is one of those movies that I don't think was on a lot of our radars mm. prior to that first trailer dropping that very well could end up in a lot of our top 10 films of the year list. It just looks tight. The tone they're going for, how good was does Woody Harrelson look in this? Great. Like the way he's communicating, all that kind of stuff. Casey looks great. Anthony Mackie looks great. This from top to bottom looks like it's going to be the film that we go, we did not see this coming. Mm -hmm. I mean, now we do because we right. saw the trailer, but I'm suddenly, I've got extremely high hype. Love this trailer. Yeah, Chewy Tell. Chewy I mean, Tell it's got everybody, yes, Chewy Tell everybody's in it. And it's like, uh, it's directed by John Hillcoat, who did the amazing The Proposition. So he's been on my list, on my radar ever since. Such that an film. underrated film. Yeah. If you haven't seen The Proposition, check it out. This director is a great director. And when I saw that first trailer two months ago and I saw his name, I was like, oh my God. And I love that first trailer. I was almost hesitant to want to see another trailer because I'm like, that first trailer was so kind of almost abstract in its visuals. It just showed you so many powerful visuals that I knew I couldn't wait to see it. This, you get a little bit more of the story. What's a 999? You get a little bit more about why it's called Triple Nine. But it's just enough to whet your appetite where it looks like a visual dynamo. And it looks like a really strong, fun, exciting thriller heist. Bad, you know, cops gone bad, villains, you know, every everything coming at you. It looks, it, the trailer's fantastic. So. And, and two actors that we loved on TV might be making a big impression on the big screen, too, with Aaron Paul and Norman Reedus, both going to totally. be in there from Breaking Bad and from Walking Dead. I can't wait to see how their characters shape up. And Anthony Mackie, that could be a career-making performance for him, because I've always loved him in movies, like, obviously, when he plays Falcon, or even in Our Brand is Crisis, when he had a little bit of a comedic element to it. That ain't going to be this movie at all. Right. He's a really torn dude in this trailer. So, yeah, this one, it's already on my most anticipated list of next year. Will it be in the top Ten, we're gonna have to wait a long. You're time. mentioning like, where's Kate Winslet? Like, Kate, I, yeah. I, I, I didn't recognize Aaron Paul at first. Like they, like the, it's right. just like, oh, so many good things going for this. All right, what's next? Two brand new posters for the upcoming comedy sequel Zoolander Two have hit the web. The film opens on February 12th and stars Ben Stiller. Um, he describes the film as follows. Excuse me. It's basically Derek and Hansel 10 years later. Though the last movie ended on a happy note, a lot of things have happened in the meantime. Their lives have changed and they're not really relevant anymore. It's a new world for them. Schnepp, do you buy or sell these new Zoolander 2 posters? I I'll, I'll wear that perfume. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I buy it. I mean, it's fun to see Ben Stiller return to this comedic role. I don't know how long ago Zoolander was. It was it's came out before ago. Finding Nemo. It's pretty yeah. long ago. So I'm... <laughs> I'm happy to see that, you know, they've been, you know, talking about doing Zoolander 2 for so many years. And then even when they were like, we're doing it, I still didn't believe them. And even when they had that fake trailer, like the walk in the fashion runway, still was like, I don't know if it's ever going to come out. And so now we're seeing these, you know, these posters for it. I still don't know if it's going to come out. I think they're done. I, I think know they're, they're done. done. I just, too, I can't yeah. wait mm -hmm. to see it. I really enjoyed that movie. It was so stupid, especially <laughs> those idiots playing in front of the gas station ah, with the gas. It's not a spoiler, guys. You that is one of my all time. Yeah. Like I've got a list of my top ten single funniest moments yes. in movies. Uh, Dark Helmet saying, "Now you see that evil always triumphs because good is dumb." Is my number one. It will always be my number one. But in the top five is that gasoline fight. It's the hilarious. gasoline fight is it's, hilarious. Look, I don't know that there's anybody in this room that loves uh, the original Zoolander as much as I do. I still watch it about five times a month uh, because when I go to bed, I like to put something on, and I'm usually putting on Zoolander. I just I love that movie so much. I hated the trailer. I really did. I think I was the only person uh, who like really, really hated the trailer. I thought it was just dumb. I'm not funny, fun, dumb, just bad. 
these posters. These posters capture all the essence of the original Zoolander. Um, so I love the posters. They capture exactly what they're supposed to capture. So for me, these posters are a big buy. What about you? <laughs> I can kind of pull that off. I can kind of pull that That's off, right. but not good enough to be on the poster of Zoolander 2, which I love this poster. I love the trailer. I love when Owen Wilson and Ben Stiller performed on the actual runway of a fashion shoot in France. And this poster, it is so hard to sell a comedy just from the poster because it's really hard to have a still image and get a lot of laughs. Usually you just throw who the town is and we just expect them to be funny because, oh, it's Bill Murray or it's Chris Rock or whoever it is. We're like, oh, yeah, this will probably be funny. This poster made me laugh out loud. Yeah. Watching them do selfies instead of actually looking into the camera. Yeah. <laughs> just trying to advertise their movie. It's so hilarious. So, yeah, I can't wait to see this flick. All right, what's next? As some of you may know, the writer-director of this year's acclaimed film Ex Machina, Alex Garland, is next directing the Paramount Pictures film Annihilation, described as a futuristic gothic horror. Earlier this year, actress Natalie Portman signed on to star in the film, and now it looks like we have our other lead. According to a report in Variety, Paramount is currently in talks with Jane the Virgin star Gina Rodriguez for an as-of-yet undisclosed role. Schnepp, do you buy or sell the sounds of Annihilation with Gina Rodriguez on board? I buy everything about the sounds of Annihilation. I love Alex Garland as a writer, all of his work with Danny Boyle. I loved Ex Machina. Not as much as I wanted to. I, I think it was a great film. Oh, really? I think it it's like falls into like an extended Black Mirror episode as far as... I still liked it. I just didn't love it as much as you guys Black Mirror's did. pretty great. I love Black Mirror. I'm just saying it's like, <laughs> I liked it. I didn't love it. But I love Alex Garland's work just in general. So to see that he's getting a chance to do a bigger budget science fiction film, not only with Natalie Portman, but with this actress, I, I buy this a thousand percent. I know no, we're not buying and selling, yeah, but we I'm are. buying. We're buying and selling. We're buying? I'm we're buying. buying. Hey, man, I'm buying. <laughs> uh, I'm going to buy this, too. I, I have not watched Jane the Virgin, but I know she got like some some Emmy consideration for her mm -hmm. role in it, and I've seen a lot of interviews because she is like blowing up. She's yeah. like all over the place. She seems really charming and delightful. She's got a really interesting project coming up with Mark Wahlberg, uh, Deepwater Horizon. Mm. She's got that one coming up, which should be really interesting to see her in that. Pairing her with an actress like Natalie Portman. Natalie Portman is a girl we do not see enough of these days. Mm -hmm. Now she's got Jane's Got a Gun coming out here pretty soon with Natalie Portman. Looking forward to that. But getting her back on screen, pairing with that, and a what do they call it? A dark, dark gothic, dark gothic uh, horror. Right. horror, horror. Yeah. And this could be really fascinating. I like the pairing, so for me, it's a buy. Well, we're going to see more Natalie Portman later today when we watch the Phantom Menace here in Columbia. Oh, that's Studios, right. But, oh. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, it's going to be, it's not going to be. I'm looking forward to the Darth Maul lightsaber scene. Uh, Gina Rodriguez looks like one of the talents. And I'm so happy to see a young actress that's being considered for a role that's not the Baywatch movie. Like, this is, this looks awesome. And everything I'm hearing about Annihilation, obviously, I haven't read the source material myself. But the fact that they're going to some weird coastal place where there's a lot of scientific oddities and it's defying the laws of physics sounds awesome. Her and Natalie Portman together, I am locked into this pick. All right, what's next? Speaking of Paramount, Paramount Animation has just announced their release schedule for their upcoming <laughs> slate of films. Included in the list of upcoming movies are The Little Prince, coming in March, Monster Trucks, a hybrid of live action and CGI animation, opening in January of 2017, SpongeBob SquarePants 3, coming in February of 2019, Amusement Park, which will open March 22nd, 2019, from veteran animation director Dylan Brown, known as the supervising animator on Ratatouille, and Finding Nemo, and directing animator on Toy Story, and finally, Sherlock Gnomes, a sequel to Gnomeo and Julie Yet, which will hit theaters on January uh, in January of 2018. John, do you buy or sell this lineup for Paramount Animation? Overall, I'm going to sell it. Um, it's like this isn't like a Pixar lineup or a Disney lineup or even a DreamWorks lineup. That there's a number of projects in there. Although, okay, while I'm going to sell it, there are two in there that have my curiosity. One is Amusement Park, mm -hmm. simply because you got one of the the creative minds behind Ratatouille, Toy Story, things like that. On that basis alone, you at least right. have to have your interest peak. I mean, Monster Truck sounds like it's going to be a bad Cars ripoff with a little bit of live action incorporates. I, 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 who knows? There's nothing there to make me get excited at this point. Movie's years away, though, so plenty of time to get excited. So I'm kind of curious about Amusement Park, and I gotta say, I found the first Nomeo and Juliet, while not a wonderful movie, I thought it was cute, and I thought it was charming. And the idea about Sherlock Gnomes, that's kind of cute. They're getting some of the voice talent back from the original. So I'm curious about that. But overall, I, I, very little interest in their little Prince project. Very little interest in another Square, uh, square 
uh, SpongeBob. SpongeBob square pants. <laughs> square Bob. Bob. Square bottoms. He's uh, a sponge and his pants are kind of square. He's looking. kind of spongy and he lives under the water. <laughs> and uh, very little interest in Monster X. So, so overall, while I do believe there are some shining things in there, overall, I'm going to give it a sell for now. What about you, Schnapp? Yeah, I'm totally selling this. This feels like like the throwaways that Pixar left in their garbage can. <laughs> and then somebody from Paramount was like sifting through what it. What do we like, got? What's in here? Here's like a Stephen, Stephen King like kind of joke movie about the maximum overdrive. It's called Monster Trucks, but it's got a comedic edge. Take it, take it. What else do they have? It's a Nomeo and Juliet, but it's with Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Gnomes? That made me, my stomach quivered when I read that this no, morning. No, you get it like, though, because Gnomes sounds I, like Holmes. As long That's as good. Ozzy's in it. I, I don't, don't think care. you get it, Schnepp. What? Holmes yeah. rhymes with no. Oh my God! Now it's I got a play it. On words. It's still garbage. <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm with you though. The amusement park one. The only reason that, that I clicked on that one, I was like, oh, they're gonna have like talking roller coasters, and they're gonna have that weird squid thing that makes you throw up, and that's gonna be alive and talking, right? Uh, I have no yeah, idea. I I'm making it up. I, I don't know. I sell it. Mark of <laughs> a heart, gentlemen. I'm going to buy this simply because I'm not. if I'm prospecting scouts for the Yankees, I'm not hoping you're the next Babe Ruth, okay? I just want you to be able to get on the field and play ball, and it looks like this lineup can do that with the one exception of the Little Prince. I despise the Little Prince, almost on a Fantasia level to me. Damn. I'm not a strong reader, and I'm not great at speaking French. I had to do both those <laughs> things in 10th grade. We had to actually read the Little Prince. It was entirely in French, Le Petit Prince, or whatever the hell it is, and I flunked out of French. It didn't because make you cry because I didn't understand it. I didn't. I, I got through three pages. And I was like, I don't know how to conjugate a verb in English, much less in French. <laughs> Everything else about this seems cool, though. The SpongeBob had so much potential in that movie that it didn't. It wasn't fully realized in that flick, but I think they can do that. So I want to see more SpongeBob and monster trucks. I'm a dude who was born in North Carolina. You throw monster trucks at me, I'm gonna enjoy the hell out of those things. Plus, amusement <laughs> parks. We can all agree mm. sounds like a winner. And I like the first Nomeo and Juliet more than I thought I would. Is Elton John gonna do Sherlock? Gnomes too. Yes, <laughs> I want to see yes, most of these movies. With it, yes. So I mean, look. Overall, I don't love the slate as much as I love something like a Pixar slate or obviously a Marvel or Star Wars slate. But this seems exciting. I think it's going to be okay. Mark, you, know, you convince me. I'm going to pull the Little Prince out, and I'm buying that one because <laughs> I that, all the other garbage I forgot about Little Prince. I got to pull that out of the garbage and put that. That's I'm buying that. I think Little Prince is great. I got to give it a shot. As, so as a Canadian, I had to take uh, I had to take French till grade ten, like from grade four to grade ten. Yeah, I had to take French. But I, I'm just, did you have I'm, to read the Little Prince in French? Um, we, I know we had to read the, read the Little Prince. I don't know if we did it in French, though. I oh, can't remember. Yeah. Sinead, I'm curious. You're looking at this list of animations that are coming out. Which one appeals to you the most? Which one do you see on this list? You go, yeah, I'll look forward to that one. Uh, probably Amusement Park, just because it sounds different. Yeah. Um, I agree. When, when I read Monster Trucks, I thought of Cars. Mm -hmm. And the SpongeBob movie didn't really... Um, it didn't do it for me. I was really excited about the like SpongeBob becoming or going to the big screen, and it just didn't do it. So I'm not you didn't excited. You love the dolphin scene. No. The dolphin. Was I mean, great. like, yeah, it was a good movie. I just, I think I, I grew up with SpongeBob. Like that was the cartoon you watched every day. So I had like huge hopes, and it just didn't deliver. I heard that one of the ones that they did not use was Christmas Bush, uh, which was uh, originally came from <laughs> Sinead DeFries. I'll let her explain that sometime. All right, what's next, Sinead? <laughs> God, that just sounds like so many different things, John. It sounds yeah. like one thing to and me. You're the one who said it. I'm just <laughs> no, that was an in <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this was an innocent joke that happened. Ray Ora brought in a Christmas bush this morning. He said, yeah. we got it's like a little tree. It's a Christmas, Christmas tree, but it's a, it's a little tiny. It's a little sad looking, yeah. I said, looks like a Christmas bush. Yeah. And we just <laughs> started it. making up an animated cartoon that I think Paramount Pictures <laughs> should buy from us immediately <laughs> because their slate's so horrible. <laughs> Christmas bush. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's next? All right, Entertainment Weekly's newest issue will feature four brand new covers with Star Wars The Force Awakens characters. The four covers will feature Han Solo, Rey, Finn, and R2-D2, and C-3PO, all of which you can see right here. So, Mark, buy or sell these new covers for Entertainment Weekly. I mean, what am I going to do? Am I going to buy Paramount's animated slate and not buy the Star Wars <laughs> Entertainment <laughs> Weekly covers? Damn right I'm buying these things. I love them, particularly Han Solo in the classic Han Solo yeah. gun pose. We know... what what we're getting with Ray and Finn, so the Stormtrooper and her looking in an action thing. And I love that C-3PO and R2-D2, 30 years later, are we still having a Christmas bush, gentlemen? <laughs> there was some comment that's now happening right now that I'm not privy to. <laughs> I'm just going to say, I love those two droids still being the ambassador to Star Wars. Gentlemen, I am trying to make a point Sorry. about a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. What was the comment, and how bad is it going to hurt my feelings? There's no. got a bunch of people in the live chat board who are like writing in, 
Christmas Bush 2016, but one is <laughs> one is hashtag force for Bush. Force for Bush. <laughs> Wow. That's awful. Yeah. I'm disgusted in all of you. I do not endorse this. I'm sorry. We're talking Star Wars posters. Yeah. Woo! Star yeah. Wars covers. A lot of covers. A lot of covers there. Love them. I love that that Hans featured on one of them. Going back to what we were talking about, about what, like the international poster that cut out like six of the characters, right. still had Han. Then they put up <laughs> that one set of things that was only... They put out four character posters. One of them was hot. You know, early on, we talked about this with Princess Leia. I think a lot of us had some expectation that not only Leia, but also probably Han plays a, a very, not even secondary, but maybe a third level uh, character in the film or fourth, maybe just in there just a little bit. But now that more and more promotional material is coming out, we saw the character posters. Han is one of the four. They put out these Entertainment Weekly covers. Han is one of the four. He made the cut onto the international poster, much like Princess Leia did. Um, I'm starting to get the feeling that we're Han is one of the primary characters in this film. Mm -hmm. So I think we're also getting a bit of this. And they just look great. I think they look wonderful. Yeah. What do you think, Schnapp? I love the covers. I especially, I want to know why C-3PO has a red arm. What's yeah, going, I, I, going there, on with that? I think there's a story to I that. I hope there's a story behind it. Maybe, maybe it'll be done like as a, a strange prequel or something. Hey, you know? Christian! Christian probably knows what Why the answer does, is. I mean, look, but again, Wookiees have a tendency to rip people's arms out of their right. sockets when they hey, lose. You would know this. In in, in our, our resident canon expert of all things the Star Wars comics, uh, Christian Harloff is Christian, in here. Get over here. You guys. get over here just for a second. Do we know? He's has, always standing just off set. He yeah. kind of, he lives in the other room. So <laughs> there, there goes. Yeah. Do, Don't have fun with your the Christmas comic push. books. Do the comic books at all either directly reference or give us any hint as to the red arm on C-3PO, why he has it or where he got Not it from? Not the comic book, but there is a the young reader novel by um, Jason Fry in, in Weapon of a Jedi does reference it. It just it shows a picture of it. You don't really reference exactly what happened to him, but you see him with the red arm in the illustration of the girl that he's talking to and telling the story of Luke. So okay. that's, that's the only reference that we've get that kind of so far as far as what happened, but not as how it happened. Did C-3PO not let the Wookiee win? I would assume that is correct. <laughs> that all is right. probably yeah. part of the I love, I, I buy all the Star see, we Wars all, entertainment. Not people, see, we <laughs> all actually live here. This is a movie talk commune. <laughs> that's right. So we're all available at the drop of a hat to come in at and lend any expertise. Moment. Yeah. Any moment, anybody can drop in. <laughs> Everyone we? from Collider will come around and worship the Christmas bush of 2015. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, listen, it is Wednesday, which means it's time for us to talk a little bit of Rewind, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. This is a segment we uh, we playfully call the feeling old segment because you just can't believe these movies are this old. <laughs> We're, this is where we talk a little bit about the films that have turned 10 years old this week and the films celebrating their 20th anniversary this week. So let's start with the ones that are turning 10. The movies turning 10 are, of course, the Jennifer Aniston, uh, I said, that, that's not Jude Law, that's uh, Clive uh, Owen, Clive Owen. Yeah. and Clive Owen classic Derailed. We have the 50 Cent classic Get Rich or Die Tryin'. And we have the Josh Hutcherson classic Zathura, A Space Adventure, turning I can't believe this one. Turning 20 years old this week. The sequel, <laughs> Ace Ventura, When Nature Calls. I cannot believe that movie is 20 years old. Anyway, Schnapp, this list of four films we got here celebrating anniversaries. Which one stands out to you? Well, I remember Zathura standing out because it was disappointing to me. I was looking forward to it, and it just didn't hit it for me. So I remember not really liking it. I remember seeing... Uh, the 50 Cent movie, like on basic cable at like two in the morning. The same year it came out, I just think it went right to basic cable. And uh, it was fun. Uh, it doesn't really stand out to me. But uh, the one that does stand out the most is the Ace Ventura. That I can't believe that the sequel is 20 years old, let alone the original one. And once again, the sequel wasn't as funny as the first Ace Ventura Pet Detective, which I loved. The sequel fell flat in so many different ways that it never had another sequel. So... What about you, Mark? Which yeah, is this one stand out? I agree. I mean, I, I was a kid growing up, Jim Carrey was a monster influence on mm -hmm. me from In Living Color. And then when he had Ace Ventura come out, I never laughed so hard in a movie theater. I can still watch Ace Ventura Pet Detective to this day and laugh every yep. moment 
Ace Ventura, When Nature Calls, was just a bummer. And I remember like walking out of the theater, and it's like one of those things, like, how do you handle a disappointment like that? Because it was like, maybe I need to go see it again. Because some of the jokes in there were funny, but overall it felt like Jim Carrey was doing an impression of Ace Ventura rather than actually becoming the character. And I was very impressed by Get Rich or Die Trying. And Derailed was a movie that I just remember thinking, I'm so waiting for Netflix for this one or whatever <laughs> service at the time is going right. to you know, let me get my DVD. Maybe Redbox wasn't around. It was around called then, Blockbuster at the time. Was, it w- I would go to let Blockbuster. Let me tell you tales of the ancient company <laughs> called the Blue Buster. Box where you I would look like at these boxes for hours. Somebody asked us a, a while ago on, on Movie Talk, what was the last movie you remember renting? Derailed might have been that. It might not have been Blue Crush. It might have been Derailed. I, I, this slight block, I don't know why I'm thinking this, a little bit of an aside. So I was interviewing, um, who was I talking to? I was sitting down with uh, Zach Galifianakis and Will Ferrell. Wow. And uh, for, I won't go into why, but they, Zach Alphanax and Will Ferrell were, pu- were pulling money out of their wallet to give to me. I'll explain that in another story. <laughs> so they're pulling money out of the wallet, and Will Ferrell goes, goes I, I, I've got a Blockbuster card. <laughs> and, and Zach Galifianakis goes, Well, you're really up to date. And he goes, What are you talking about? I just bought stock in this company. I think it was a solid investment. <laughs> and it was, and yeah, it was funny. The one that stands out to me on this list is, is Ace Ventura Pet Detective, uh, too, because I remember. It being, I think, the first comedy sequel where I learned the very harsh lesson in life, sometimes comedy sequels really suck. Mm-hmm. I was, you, you can't understand how much I love the first Ace Ventura Pet Detective. It's the movie that I first fell in love with, Courtney Cox, and she was like my mm. celebrity crush for a good 10 years <laughs> after watching that movie. And then I saw the sequel, and I don't even think Courtney was in the sequel nope, at all. Nope. There's the one moment in When Nature Calls where uh, Jim Carrey is coming out of the mechanical rhinoceros's backside yeah. and somebody sees it happening. I remember thinking, okay, I chuckled a little bit at that, but oh, I mean, that movie was just so bad on so many levels. And as big as Jim Carrey's career got, can you imagine if he railed off Ace Ventura Pet Detective, The Mask, and then a good Ace Ventura Pet Detective 2? Right. Like, it, it's big now, but it's hard to imagine, like, if he didn't have that big road bump, how much bigger it would have gotten in that time period? Yeah, it's it was like imagine. his first three movies, Ace Ventura, The Mask, and Dumb and Dumber came out right. of the gate so hard. And then mm-hmm. Ace Ventura, When Nature Calls, and Cable Guy, even though a lot of people really loved that movie, wasn't critically, or right. it didn't do that well at the box office. So that was kind of like the, yeah, okay. Cable Guy is an underrated film. I, I've oh, it watched is. it a yeah. couple times recently in the last few years. It is fantastic. And Directed he's by Derek Zoolander. That's right. Yeah. Uh, really? I didn't yeah, realize that. Yeah, Ben Stiller did a great job on that. All right, folks, well, we've reached that part of the show now for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, you can just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Maybe you'll see one of your questions pop up on Movie Talk Monday through Friday. Maybe you'll see us use it on our mailbag shows on Saturday or Sunday, or maybe it won't make it on at all because we do have like thousands come in every single week. (laughs) But mail us, collidervideo at gmail.com. Let's see if we can get your question on the show. Now, for those of you watching us live, and there are thousands of you watching us live right now, you can interact with us live right now, and we're going to save a little bit of time at the end of the show to take your live Twitter questions. So if you're watching us live right now, make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video, and then tweet us a message with your question. And when we get to the end of the show, Sinead's going to pick out a bunch, and we will answer those questions on this show. So first, let's get to the mailbag question. Sinead, what's our question today? Neil Mahoney writes in, Hey there, Collider crew. Do you think that there is a song that has perfectly ended a movie, encapsulating the tone and or or feel. Thanks and keep up the great work. Schnapp, what about you? Is there a song like at the end of a film that's like, this song is the perfect bow to finish off this movie? I thought I nailed it perfectly this morning when I came in and gave you guys my, I was like, 16 Candles, it's the yep. Thompson Twins. Um, <laughs> that little song at the end. You were very proud. You very, played the song for did. us yeah. in the movie. That song is everybody just quiet for me. I was like, it's got There's a slow beginning. Just give it, give it 35, 50 <laughs> we seconds. We wanted to go it's back gonna, to the rest of the meeting, and he get, wouldn't let us yeah. talk. I was like, just hang on. Hang, ep, ep, ep. It's almost about to start. And then while we were waiting for the song to kick in, which is awesome, and if you've never heard the Thompson Twins, get on that. Um, Dennis Zhang had to kill it and be like, yeah, but Schnapp, what about Breakfast Club? And he trumped me. And he was like, just trump my ass, son. I'm taking it. I'll give you credit, but I'm taking that one, too. Oh, yeah. 
God, the, so, the breakfast. That's breakfast a perfect breakfast one. Cup. Don't you forget yeah. about Don't me. Don't you forget about me. Simple Minds, Simple baby. Simple Minds. So that's the mm-hmm. one that you know that is even more <laughs> memorable. So 80s. Son. Yeah. What's yours, Mark? Oh boy, do I have a bunch of them. If I can go score first, I mean, obviously the the end title march from the first Star Wars is the reason why I'm under 200 pounds because it keeps me on a treadmill. <laughs> um, as far as like songs go, I got a few. Top Gun, the end. You've lost that love and feeling by the Righteous Brothers mm-hmm. is great. Uh, Stand by Me, but the the Benny King original version at yeah. the end of Stand by Me. Um, and uh, and okay, so I got two more. Okay, I have Humans Being, which is the song that kind of broke up the Van Hagar era of Van Halen, but it was at the end of Twister, and it made perfect sense to be in there. Mm. And another one I'm going to come back to because I forgot it. I remembered it back in time. Huey Lewis at the end of Back oh, to the Future yeah. might be the most perfect yeah. ending, encapsulating <laughs> I, what the movie was about to totally. me. I'm glad that's you remembered Back in Time because yeah. I was going to say, what about that Back to the Future Huey Lewis? But I couldn't remember what it's called. <laughs> Gotta get back in <laughs> time. Yeah. Uh, for me. I it this song literally makes me weep. It's so, it's so perfect because I remember what, when I watched the movie and this song started to play, it just took me through the whole thing. Listening to the song just transformed me through all the entire franchise. That was Annie Lennox's Into the West, the final song that plays at the end of Lord of the Rings: The Return of the King. When you listen to that music, we were actually me, Dennis, and Wendy were in the car coming back from lunch, and we started talking about it. So I got back in the office and I just put that on and I started blaring it. And I'm just remembering all the all the amazing memories of watching the Lord of the Rings films in there. And by the way, treat yourself. Hop on YouTube and look up Annie Lennox's performance of Into the West at the Oscars, because which, by the way, won the Academy Award for Best Song. Right, right. Um, so go and look up her performance in it. So Annie Lennox is just. Hey. Oh my God! I got one. Caddyshack. I'm all right. <laughs> Nobody worry about me. Hey, come on, man. That's not a bad love, one too. Love you do gophers. a great gopher dance. Yeah, gopher <laughs> that, dance. yeah, it was a pretty good gopher <laughs> dance. <laughs> Now I know we should be for next Halloween. All right. right. (laughs) Uh, I said, guys, that we would get to your live Twitter questions. We're going to do that right now. Once again, make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video. Tweet in your questions right now. Sinead is picking them out. So, Sinead, what do we have in the Twitter stream? Um, At Shoviat tweets, Hi, guys. Love the show. Do you think that Avatar has the potential to become a huge multimedia franchise like Star Wars? It really depends on what they decide to do with these next three movies that they're doing. I mean, in what direction that they go. Look, I I firmly believe this. The next Avatar film, Avatar 2 is not going to make the money that Avatar 1 did. Uh, But that doesn't mean it's not going to be a huge, massive hit, because I believe it will be a huge, massive hit. But are they going to do it in such a way that can do a bunch of other stuff? I don't know if James Cameron has those types of aspirations. I think he's got bigger fish he wants to fry, and I don't know if he's so keen on licensing off his intellectual property to go off and do things like Saturday morning cartoons or or a Netflix show or whatever. I, I don't know that he would want to go in that direction, not to mention the way he makes these Avatar movies makes it very cost prohibitive mm-hmm. for doing something on TV or anything like that. So. Let's not be surprised by anything. My first reaction would probably be no, they wouldn't. I don't know, Shep, what do you think? It's hard to tell. I mean, Cameron's always on the edge of uh, technology, like yeah. on the cusp of it. So who's to say that he's not developing like an Avatar VR world that can be, by the time the third movie rolls out, you can be part of this immersive Avatar universe. I wouldn't say that that's not possible. I'm looking forward to his Avatar films. I'm hoping that they re-release the very first Avatar that at least maybe six months before they release the second one and maybe do an up-res or an upgrade on it so that everyone can kind of get back into that world because it'll be how many years since Avatar, the first one, came out when the second one's finally coming out? Almost 10 years. So Wow, is it that long? Yeah, it will be yeah. when it finally shows up. Like I think it's 2017. Mm-hmm. It's not coming out next yeah. year. So by 2017, it'll be like 10 years. So hopefully they released the first Avatar. You know, remember they came out with like four different special editions, like watch the seven hour version. You're like, dude, it's too long. You know, so I've seen one of the versions that was like, ex- and some watch extended version, <laughs> some extended version. So whatever, I hope they put it back out, but I'm looking forward to it. I, I really, I really liked Avatar. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the goal with Avatar, with the reason why he's coming back to Avatar, one of the reasons is that you can have a lot of different media versions and a lot of platforms to expose this war on it. There's a lot of stuff with the Navi that you can get into. The first film, which is so visually breathtaking, it all Almost, it was like the all the storylines took a backseat to what we were experiencing visually. So now that we've kind of gotten used to that world just a little bit, maybe we'll have a better chance to, if they re-release the first movie before we see the sequel, we can get into the actual dynamics of what's going on with the native tribe versus other people that are trying to come in there and what's right. happening with their environment. Now look, James Cameron has also, I mean, he created Terminator, and we've seen what happens with Terminator. There's video games, there's novels, there's, there was a TV show, so yeah. it would be nothing new for a James Cameron property to have that happen. I think you'll see novelizations and stuff like that 
video game. The first Avatar looks like a damn video oh, game. Video Why not game make a sure. video game yeah. of the other ones coming up? So TV would be a little hard to do, though. Uh, right. Just a quick fact check. So the original Avatar came out in 2009. The next one comes out in 2017. It'll be eight full years eight, right. in between sequels. Interesting. All right, what's next? Gary tweets, whatever happened to the Tom Hardy Elton John biopic? Great question. I mean, as far as I know, it's so. I let you guys comment on that. Let me look something up. I think what? Tom Hardy's doing the soundtrack for Sherlock Gnomes. No. Oh. <laughs> I remember hearing about that and thinking, like, like, just look at Tom Hardy. Then you look at Elton John. You're like, how could this? Egg? That could actually yeah. work. And Tom. he could play the guy through so so much of his career because yeah. he could still be young enough to be the early Elton John singer songwriter prodigy days. Mm -hmm. You know, when he went on the Troubadour Pinball and Wizard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there, there's so many things he could do through that, through what Elton John is now. Um, I. I think that it's still in the works, I believe, unless John and his research department can correct me. I think that that is still something that's going on. Tom Hardy is one of the greatest actors working in our field right now. I mean, if you haven't seen Bronson, check out Bronson. I mean, that guy is fantastic. So I'm looking forward to anything he does. So if he's playing Elton John, I'm going to check it out. For sure. Yeah. Now, as of I'm just looking at some reports from back in April where uh, as, as far as I know, the project is still on. Now, back in April, Tom Hardy started talking about how I can't sing. Uh, he said mm -hmm. this was pretty good. I'm not really drawn towards singing to singing and musicals and that stuff. I did some rap when I was a kid, but uh -huh. I'm somebody. But I'm somebody's dad now, so it wouldn't be too cool to crack that out. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna guess that when we see him in this movie, it does sound like it's still on track. It's still gonna be happening, but uh, it's not gonna be a Meryl Streep thing. Uh, where she's actually doing all of her own singing. I think this is going to be a situation where you see him open his mouth. It's probably going to be another vocal. I'm more interested to see how many piano lessons he takes, you know, because <laughs> Elton John's one hell of a keyboard player. Oh, Tom Hardy's been practicing all, all the time on Dub Smash. Every every time you see him, like he's rocking some kind of weird hip hop thing. <laughs> just, just, you know, doing karaoke style miming so he can easily mime Elton gotta John. say this though one of the coolest musical things I'd ever seen was Elton John on, uh, it's a dueling piano setup with two grand pianos facing each other Elton John and Billy Joel oh, yeah. were rocking out on stage one time and it was like holy crap mm -hmm. that was good alright what's next Michael tweets guys how do my uh, how do airplane companies get the rights to show movies on their flights yeah, it's like a, it's a totally just different distribution deal. Like when you make these movies, there are whole types of contracts and deals you can make. Uh, one with theatrically, then with mm -hmm. television, then with this, then with then with streaming services and whatever. And one big one is like hotel chains yep. is is one, and airlines is one. So they just make a content deal. The airline pays them a certain amount of money to do it, yep. and it's as simple as that. Any other? There's also boats. You want to go on? Yeah, a boat cruise, cruise lines have all that kind they of stuff. They got that. Yep. There's a military. There's a whole division of the military where you can license your films to the military, different military wings and divisions. I mean, you make a film, it gets cut up in all different kinds of realms, and especially if television series and shorts, all those things get dispersed throughout all media. So planes are just one part of it. Yeah, and if you if you have the pleasure of riding on either the R2-D2 or BB-8 plane that just got introduced this yes. past year, you can watch the Star Wars movies in the air for the very first time. Nothing will ever take away like the suspense right. of when the the whoever the flight attendant is comes on the PA and you're sitting in there and you forgot or your, your, your laptop died and you have nothing to do for five hours and they're about to announce the movie please you know if you want to buy headphones for our in-flight movie Tomb Raider 2 or whatever the hell it is <laughs> wow. like you're like oh man you're really holding your breath but now with the way they do it with movies there's so many movies you can watch on airplanes that it kind of takes away that suspense I just had a great an incredible multi-trillion dollar idea just paint an airplane completely black and only show like airplane movies like crash disaster films things that take place yeah, on an I, airplane. I'm not sure many people would fly Snakes that airline. on a plane. Come on, guys, it's fantastic. If it was a black airplane yeah, and fun, they fun. showed Passenger 57 because you always bet on black. There you go. I and, think and he's your pilot. <laughs> Wesley Snipes is, Wesley Snipes plane too. is your pilot. See, Sign that up flight it. I might fly on. All right, what's next? There's so many um, Christmas Bush tweets. <laughs> uh, really quick, Chris tweets, Aunt May 2, Attack of the Christmas Bush. Aunt May 3, Return of the Christmas Bush. Yeah. Hey, how did you read our scripts? Me and Ellis have been working on it. We were just doing a polish with Campia earlier this morning. How did you get a hold of our I thought our you only secret... gave the rights to the airline for no, that. No, no, no. The, only the, the dark gothic airline from the future that only plays <laughs> horror movies that are set on airplanes. Uh, they funny. have the rights. Um, at Curious Corduroy, and actually a lot of people are you want you guys to talk about Gem and the Holograms. At Curious Corduroy tweets, how do you guys feel about Gem and the Holograms being pulled from the theaters after just two weeks? LOL. It, it, it was amongst the greatest box office catastrophes of all time. Uh, I mean, you had a film playing in 2,400 screens, a massive wide release, made like one point something million dollars its opening year, some, somewhere in that neighborhood. 
Uh, its second week had like a 90 or an 85% drop from that already right. abysmal number. No theaters wants to play it. Right. No theaters want to take up their screen time that's going to have two people sitting in there buying two people worth of popcorn and two people worth of soda. They want to put a movie in there that's going to have like 60 people in there or 70 people in there at least. Um, so it was no surprise. It was the right move. And I believe Jobs might have got pulled as well. I think I heard Jobs got pulled hmm. um, as well, which also which had was a massive blockbuster hit compared to Gem and the Holograms, right. but not, not performing the way they wanted to. So I'm not surprised, not earth shattering. It's, it's a film that really underperformed and they pulled it early. So, yeah, that's pretty much that. Yeah, I think at least you can still see jobs in smaller theaters or right. at least at, at a theater that's playing in, in a major city that like might have Oscar contention like Chicago, New York, or Los Angeles. Gem and the Holograms, Rock the Casbah was the one that bummed me out that I think they pulled that from oh, theaters pretty quickly, bomb. too. But that Gem and the Holograms was a perfect storm of just a marketing misfire because you had a name, Gem and the Holograms, that didn't resonate with the fan base that originally loved it, and you tried to update a story for a new generation that didn't care about said name. Plus, they tried to do way too much of that movie, and it failed on almost every front even though i didn't hate watching the movie i understand why it got pulled so quick yeah and i'm not bummed that i didn't get the chance to see it <laughs> it's like it's like when i heard that it got pulled i was like that makes sense you can I watch guess. on your black airplane yeah that's right on the, death, the one death good plane thing, the one good thing for universal though is this is that the production budget on gem the holograms was five million dollars so that's the one good new piece right, of good right. news for for universal on that this is going to be their big misfire on a record crushing year. I no studio in history has ever had the year that Universal just had. Um, so one little misfire on a, on a movie that only cost them five million to make, not right. counting uh, marketing and stuff like that, but they didn't spend a ton of marketing yeah. either. And I hope they didn't because their trailer sucked. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a misfire, but not not a big hurt. It's a, it's a great so. point. If there was a studio that had to swallow a $5 million yeah. hit, that money is laying between Universal's couch right now. Like right. Jurassic World, Fast and Furious, or you yeah, know, Furious Tyrannosaurus 8. Rex just shit yeah. that out. It's like, <laughs> that's nothing. Just bury that. Yeah. All right, what's next? Seaburn wants to know, what are the boys' favorite romantic comments? Comedies. I love me some romantic comedies, actually. One of the things we talked about a little bit earlier was my big fat Greek wedding. I really like that. You love The Proposal. I just watched that I over the weekend. I love The Proposal. I watched it again over the weekend. It's so good. Is I've seen it like 150 <laughs> times. I don't know why, but it's so good. But I thought about you because I know you always talk about that I one. I love that. You know who's great in that movie? I can't remember his name on um, on The Office, but he plays the gay character on The o he, Office. Um, the guy who has Oscar. all the Yeah, all the, yeah all and he the does careers. everything on the Island. He's in, the in stripper, Alaska. he's the lawyer, he's the... And then the he marries them at the end. That's right, too. he's an ordained minister and he marries yeah, them at the end. So that guy, good. He's hilarious in that. How many times have you guys seen this picture? <laughs> Way seen too several many times. times. I'm going to say uh, the Say Anything. That's one of my Say Anything's a good one, yeah. yeah. What about you, Mark? Uh, I'm going to go with the all-time classic When Harry Met Sally. Uh, I, I guess you could call Annie Hall a romantic comedy. I guess you could call There's Something About Mary a romantic comedy. And I'm also going to throw Definitely Maybe in there, which is it didn't get a lot of recognition when it came out. It has Ryan Reynolds, and he's telling his daughter the story of who her mom is, and there's three different that's women a, that were in his life. I don't even know if guess. I call that romantic comedy. That's more like a drama comedy, but that's a wonderfully, yeah. wonderfully done movie. One other one that uh, I really, really enjoy, and a lot of you haven't seen, I recommend you check this one out it's older it is uh steve martin's version of the cyrano de bergiac story it's oh, called sure. roxanne with yeah. daryl hannah it's funny it's yeah. funny and if you've got a kid or whatever that's cool it's a very it's a clean movie with, a, with some, some off-color jokes but pretty much straightforward clean really charming fun funny movie check out roxanne if you get a chance roxanne check is out. great too yeah and also fatal attraction hilarious <laughs> movie so this guy hooks up with a girl she comes after him with a knife it is fall down funny <laughs> i was gonna throw on eternal sunshine of the spotless mind as a fun movie to go through with a new girlfriend because it's about yeah, relationships that's a good one. Ah. all right let's take two more rapid style um, Santez tweets, do you guys think that the trend of splitting movies into two will come to an end sometime soon? I don't think it's needed for the last Hunger Games. Well, I mean, it de depends on how many more book series, three or four part book series get picked up and turned into movies. I, I get why they did it for Hunger Games. I really, I do get why they did it for Twilight. Mm -hmm. uh, I get why they did it for Harry Potter. I mean, Harry Potter, that last book is like 800 pages. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're considering the average screenplay is about 110 pages long. So that was totally understandable. So. But remember, we don't have a three or four uh, book series turned into movies every month. I mean, it doesn't happen very often. So it, it really depends. I don't think it'll, you'll see it happen too much, though. You can see how they ruined something like The Hobbit by like stretching it out into over three, three movies. Over three films. A small thought, book yeah, over three films. I mean, I yeah. love the first Hobbit. And those second two movies were like 
it could have been one movie and it just turned the third I think it's a like, two movie series that would have worked a lot better. Yeah, That's even two Which movies, originally yeah. was supposed it, it was to be. It was supposed to be that, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, the next Fifty Shades of Grey is just going to be 25 shades each year that they <laughs> split into two. I don't think you're going to see it anytime soon again, because even though it's very financially successful to do it with huge properties, I'm just not aware. Now, again, I'm not browsing the, 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 the Twilight section when I go to a bookstore, so I'm not sure what's coming up on the horizon as far as the next huge teen novel is going to be made. But those are the movies that they split into two parts and not a lot of other type of movies. So if there is one out there, it'll probably happen again. I just don't see it anytime soon. Uh, Universal Pictures has just announced Fifty Shades of Bush. Uh, <laughs> So keep your eyes open for that. The next, uh, that's the next big one coming. Okay, last question of the day. Jesse tweets: If the character is bigger than the actor, why haven't they replaced Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones? Because they haven't needed to. They, I mean, up to this point, they just haven't needed to. Um, if you can still use the actor in that role, why not? And there, there are precious. There are a few precious few roles where uh, there's an exception to every rule. And I, I think there are a few roles that you can sit back and say, yeah, this person is so synonymous with that role, it's difficult to picture somebody else. Look, there is going to be another Indiana Jones at some point. That's not Harrison Ford. Not this next movie, because right. they've already kind of settled that. But at some point, we're going to get Indiana Jones movies that are not Harrison Ford. Um, but yeah, I would just say, why haven't they replaced him? Because there hasn't been any need to replace him yet at this point. Well, they kind of replaced him when they did that television series. They just had young Indiana Jones. Yeah, made a young Indiana Jones. So, I mean, you know, and they've had like a... Good point. They had like the younger version of him in the third movie. What was that actor's name who passed away, unfortunately? Uh, Phoenix. Phoenix. River Phoenix. River Phoenix. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I like what they're talking about with like, no, we're going to keep Harrison and he's always going to be Indiana Jones, but we're going to serve it up. I know it's not going to be Mutt Jones, but they're going to give a replacement character who might take place in the 50s or the 60s where you can continue that kind of serialized fun and not redo Indiana Jones. But if they end up doing Indiana Jones in the like 20, 30 years, yeah, they'll they'll end up having to replace Harrison Ford. Yeah, and also, e even if they wanted to, it's it would have been harder. I mean, Harrison Ford's a pretty big actor, yeah. you know? But but you can do it. I mean, if they could do it with Sean Connery playing James Bond and no longer playing Bond, and they put in Roger Moore, you can do it with Indiana Jones. It's going to be hard, but I think it's going to be the right call eventually. Yeah. All right, folks. Well, that will do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk on this Wednesday. Thanks so much for joining us, guys, especially you guys who have been joining us live. Don't forget, this show does go live every day, Monday through Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So you can hop on over here at Collider Video and watch the show live or watch us later in the day on our YouTube channel. And to do that, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Take a second, stop what you're doing, and subscribe to this channel. Be kept up to date with everything we got going on here. Don't forget, lots of great films playing at our friends over at AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime and uh, movie ticket information. I want to thank all the guys sitting at the table with me today. First of all, sitting over here, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? Well, you guys can find me online later today talking Phantom Menace, yo. We're going to do Oh, little, yeah, we got to pump that. We're all going to have a lot of fun talking about that fantastic film from many years ago, a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter at John Schnepp. And you can check out the film The Death of Superman Lives. What happened by going to www.tdoslwh.com. Get a digital download and a Blu-ray and support independent film. And sitting over here, am I right? Also a part of that Phantom Menace commentary track that we're shooting later today, <laughs> Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you? That's right. I will be igniting my double-sided lightsaber into many Christmas bushes in Florida <laughs> this week and in West Palm. I'm at the West Palm Improv telling jokes. You can get tickets at MarkEllisLive.com. I'm on Twitter at 5150Ellis. And, of course, our lovely host today, the wonderful Sinead DeFree. Sinead, where can people find you online? I'm online on Twitter and Instagram at Sinead DeFree. And on Facebook and at that's so Sinead.com. And uh, you guys can follow me on Facebook and on Twitter at John Camp. Hey, listen, don't forget, if you guys love entertainment news, make sure you bookmark Collider.com, the site that cracked a lot of the stories that we did here today, especially with that Simon Kibberg interview talking about us, the release date of the new trailer for X-Men. Get on over there, bookmark Collider.com, and come on back later tonight to Collider Video. we got a lot of stuff going on today, but one of the things we do, not only do we have our Star Wars Rebel show, but... John Schnepp, myself, Mark Ellis, Christian Harloff, we are going to be watching and filming ourselves watching and talking about The Phantom Menace from start to finish. That comes up later today. And then we're going to do each Star Wars movie each week leading up to The Force Awakens this week. Week number one, The Phantom Menace. Make sure you join us for that. So special thanks to Wendy and to Dennis behind the camera. Thanks to Christian for sticking his nose in here to talk about C-3PO's red arm. And thanks to you guys, most importantly. My name is John Campion for Collider Video. And until next time, bye-bye.
Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.